Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Je uh, Bigfoot uh, Notes from the Field. See, I'm getting, you can tell I'm trying to do more than one thing at once. I'm kind of divided my attention. <laughs> Multitasking. I know. I, I sat down. I was sitting down all day, all day today just focusing on I, – I was spending a lot of time on the new um, – uh, Facebook group page that uh, David, why don't you go ahead and t talk about that again before we get rolling here? Yeah, sure thing. You guys uh, over here, uh, there's a link right there you can click on, open up another window right now. You can go there and, and click on join up in the right hand corner. <laughs> well done, man. Well yeah. done. Those are my internet savvy people. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, you guys can uh, uh, click on that link right there. It'll open up another window, and you guys can join the group there. This is going to be uh, – right now it's open and public for everyone. People can share there. Me and uh, William will actually be in there um, uh, kind of uh, uh, managing to see what's in there. If you guys see any sort of spammy stuff or anything like that you know, here in the community, please let us know. Um, just go ahead and, you know, you know, Facebook us messages or something, me or, me or, uh, William and just say, Hey guys, there's some, you know, kooks putting out some pretty crazy stuff on there. Oh. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, Nick will well, find them. Nick will find them for us. He'll pick them right, right out, man. Uh, I'll tell you what, <laughs> we've, creature. we've got a, we've got a few people that will do that. I mean, when you guys saw, yeah. you know, Mark Dooley, Mark was one of the first people, he was the first person I put in there this morning. And uh, if, if you see the kind of comments Mark makes, you know, Mark's a pretty funny guy, but he's also our, our resident skeptic for the whole organization. And he nice. kind of routinely takes people like Jeff Meldrum and a few others to task oh, just because it's sort of his, it's sort of his job in life. So if, uh, <laughs> if, if Mark sees somebody up there making some stupid comment, Mark will tear him apart before we have the opportunity to save that person by removing him from the group. <laughs> <laughs> nice so we got to save it save these spammers from mark guys so that's what we're gonna do um so let us know so that mark doesn't you know i don't know pummel them on social media um, and he will. but all yeah all groups um if you guys are part of the g uh jrg um i'll tell you this right now um all you know the videos that you'd like to share content that you want to share um and just going in there and communicating once a day or every few days as often as you can get over there and share content there and also engage with us um you can throw up questions to william he'll check it out here and there during his day and answer some of those questions this is pretty much where uh, mr jevening is going to be spending most of his time when he's on facebook uh, so he will be pouring through a lot of stuff in there um, and uh, kind of peeling through it and, you know, seeing what's going on. Look at some of the conversations that many of us are having with each other as well from the different groups and everything around the country. Um, and just an update, Monday, um, sometime right around noonish, there will be a new page uh, underneath the group. Uh, um, it will be embedded right there underneath the group uh, sign-up page on William Jevening. Uh, I'm going to put – the first one in there, the Southern Oregon one, um, I'm kind of putting that together right now. So this is the kind of information that I will be requesting from you guys that are in your groups to be put on William's website for group contact information and whatnot about your group and your area. So um, that'll be out Monday and you can take a look at it and uh, I'll put together a video kind of explaining what I need you guys to send me and where to send it. And then I'll start putting those other pages together as they, they come in. So it'll be you know, awesome. One of the things, one of the things I want to mention too about that group page. What's great about that is we we have some parts of the country, and Nick, you know this from Indiana. Yeah. Um, there's people there that have been kind of difficult for you guys to sort of coordinate with one another. Yeah. And maybe the group page is a really easy place for everybody to go up there and, and that's part of the GRG and talk to each other. Uh, yes. You know, and you know, make arrangements to maybe discuss things elsewhere but that's a great place to go up there and say hey let's you know i need to get in touch with you or or whatever what have you yeah. um it's just a nice simple place to do all that it seems nice. that uh, yep. uh the southern southern part of the state have 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 a whole lot more activity a whole lot more okay. 
I've seen that and I heard that. Uh, who's your national forest is an absolute hot spot. Yeah, I think I think Mark Dooley actually mentioned that once too. Yeah. Sometime soon, I'd like to go down there. Nice. <clears throat> well, like we lost Gerald for the moment. Uh, hopefully, he'll be back. Oh, well, I yeah. guess if if we're going to talk about, I guess we can start talking about. There isn't a whole lot. Um, Field wise, right at the moment, you know, with the holidays and everything, you know, not many people are out. I know I got information from Nathan in Utah. Basically, they were kind of snowed out, and the group that he was following there vanished. Uh, now, in the field, that's something that's not uncommon. I, I w would have a hard time expecting a particular group to be in an area uh, for very long. Typically, they're, you know, a couple of weeks and then they move on to their next feeding area. So that's pretty much what's happened there. Um, now with these groups, if you're able to, and it takes time, it takes, it could take years to actually figure out the movements of a group in a particular region and their range. I mean, depending on how big their range is and, and how they move through it. So, uh, you know, he, he happened to get lucky. There was a little bit of activity reported in that area and I was able to put him right on, onto the group, but they've since vanished. So that's on, that's a natural part of movement. Uh, our teams in New York, we've actually got some pretty good stuff going on in the state of New York right now. We have three teams, uh, of course, Jeremiah and I, uh, in the Andriondack Mountains, and uh, Gail Beatty, who's in the Hudson River Valley, and uh, Dave Gibson and his wife Pam. They're in that also that northern region. All, th all three of those belong to the Jevening Research Group now, and we just appointed Jeremiah as the uh, regional manager for that whole part of the country since he's he's a real go-getter. He does a great job. And uh, oh. <laughs> I just got a message from uh, Gerald. Gerald says, trying to find my way back. Mom is helping. So <laughs> we, can, we, we nice. can talk bad about him while he's not here. So, so other than that, um, you know, again, with the holidays, a lot of our people around the country are off doing things. There he is. Are off doing things. So uh, we haven't we haven't got a whole lot to report right now, other than there are things happening in the field, and but there's very few people out people out actually looking right at the moment. Uh, 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 Will. Yeah. How do you go and uh, track them? Because I haven't seen. No evidence in the, in some time now. Actually, I'm not going to talk about that publicly. I'll let you know privately what to look for and where to go. Okay, sure, sure. It, it, I don't want to give stuff away publicly because all the the people out there I don't Ooh, think no. deserve <laughs> to know how to find these things. I don't want them doing it. Okay, yeah, sure. There's Gerald. He's back. Well, we were just talking about you. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How are we all today? Well, Dave said to push that thing over there, and I did it. And I went, <laughs> and there you went. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that was the wrong thing to push. <laughs> uh, are you on a? Yeah, unless you're on a smartphone. Oh. <laughs> no, that's right. Don't. <laughs> I have a dumb Let's phone. <laughs> nice. Let me. Let me let me throw this topic out there that um, a few days ago, and I, I sent you guys messages about this, you know, to think about, but uh, a friend on Facebook posted a comment, apparently Matt Moneymaker on their show, Finding Bigfoot, made the comment that since, since Bigfoot is capable of ripping the arms and legs off people, uh, now this is, this is secondhand information, so it's not a quote. But I, I trust the source, and she was watching the show and, and posted the comment. Not to me, but it was made directly on Facebook. Uh, but since Sasquatches apparently have the ability to pull people apart limb by limb, but don't, they must be civilized. What? <laughs> no, he just went full. He 
he just went See, for full potato there. He just went absolutely full. Oh my god. Yeah, I mean, you know, there there's let's look at it. I mean, there's there's lots of animals that have the capability of doing harm to other animals or people, but just because they don't doesn't mean they're civilized. You know, that's that's a very it's a very shallow yeah form of thinking when it comes to wildlife and, and behaviors. You know. You know? And I, I don't I don't know if it was oh, go ahead. I, the people who are watching that show are are idiots. I'm sorry. Seriously. Well I think there's there's such a lack I think there's such a lack of you know there's a great interest in the topic yeah. but there's a lack of real good programming out there for it. There's nothing that really presents the topic um, in in its yeah. real form, uh, you know. Killing uh, the the show called the uh, Killing Bigfoot. Yeah, right. You're, you're going to <laughs> like get, they're going to go out and do that. You're you're I, I, I find that so killed if anything. <laughs> is is that the one that's done with Stacy Brown? I don't know. I just I've seen it and it's like, oh my, these guys have absolutely no idea what they're going for. And, and I'll tell you something about shows like that one. If, if that one is hosted by Stacy Brown or stars him, I, I think it is. Um, if, if everyone knows anything about that, that, that was the, um, uh, remember the show a couple of years ago, it was only, I think it only ran one season a reality show. It was something, uh, a $10 million big yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. bounty. I saw that, yeah. Now, about the time of creating that show, <clears throat> uh, I think it was Spike TV that put that out. Uh, one yeah. of their casting people contacted me and, and just happened to call me as I was waiting outside uh, doing the show for the History Channel, uh, America's Book of Secrets, The Mystery of Bigfoot. I was waiting outside uh, the place where they were filming for my turn, and I got a call on my cell phone from the casting person for that show, and she was excited to talk to me, said that I was their number one overwhelming choice for this show, and uh, I was intrigued at the moment because I didn't know anything about it, so as as I delved into finding out what the show was about, it, you know, it was, uh, it was a joke. Uh, they had a, a, a team of people who were supposed to be judging evidence, and they had ten, nine or ten teams that were all in one small geographical area. And I thought, well, how in God's name do they know, number one, where to look for Sasquatches, where they know exactly. evidence is going to be? And secondly, who are these people to judge whether evidence oh, is real or not? I had oh, never heard of any We're of experts. <laughs> we know everything about so, the subject. You know, and, and she says, well, you know, whoever brings in the best evidence is going to win $10 million and the runner up will get 100000 And Stacy Brown was, you know, I mean, I, I wanted nothing to do with the show. I, I made up an excuse why I couldn't go on it. So uh, uh, what happened was they, they had this farcical show and, you know, they ran around collecting whatever was there, whether, I don't know. I didn't watch it. I can't watch stupid television. So, um, he was the one that came out the presumptive winner. They gave him a hundred thousand dollars and some equipment. Now he's and nothing, nothing against the man personally. I don't know Stacy Brown, but you know, you can't just because you're put on television and they give you some money doesn't mean that you're automatically an expert. It means they gave you some money for, you know, promotional purposes for television. So uh, back to this whole thing about, you know, Bigfoot being civilized. Uh, that's, that's a lot of presumptive, <laughs> Uh, theorizing on virtually no information that that a statement like that means absolutely nothing and we know the truth to be the exact opposite of that you know it, these things are very intelligent but on the other hand you know they're not gonna have a picnic next to you out on a Sunday outing same thing with... exactly other oh, predators will same thing bottom line they're predators They've had thousands of years that's of practice right. in doing what they do. You know, that's what they do. No different than a bear. They're no different than a cougar. They go out, they hunt, sleep, feed, right. and breed. That's all they do. 
you say that they're civilized, they're, that don't mean they're wearing a top hat and carrying a cane out. It, it is. It, That's it, just totally asinine. That tells me one thing. My neighbor hasn't seen nothing out there, and he never has. He's nothing but a liar. You know, you have these things come in on you like we have. You know that they That's right. Anytime and they're anyone's actually, and, and we have overwhelming numbers of accounts from people that tell us that we, we can um, discern these behaviors into what the behaviors actually are, what they mean. And almost in every single case that I know of, uh, when I started really looking at predatory behavior, and that's why the next major book that I'm about halfway completed with is called Sasquatch Sign and Predatory Behavior. Because first of all, I wanted, I wanted to show people what sign looks like, you know, because every animal leaves some kind of sign behind it, whether it's footprints, scat, markings, what have you, feeding behaviors and such, uh, and, and even vocalizations. Uh, <clears throat> all of those are things that every animal does, or nearly every animal, every mammal, uh, just about in the wild. So, and these things being a large primate are going to do things that are very, very similar to other primate species. So uh, we, can, we can show that. But as I looked into this more and more, you know, as a result of researching information for the book, uh, predatory behavior sort of came to the surface. It seems to be the dominant behavior. And even, even behaviors that witnesses report sometimes that are seemingly non-hostile, that's a perception by that person or persons. It doesn't mean they have the bigger picture of knowing what's going on. And when you look at that bigger picture, it shows that they are engaged in one of the various types of predatory behaviors, or mainly feeding behaviors. Yeah. I agree. Now, of course, there is, is there any, and this is my question, is there occasionally the exception to the rule, like in many things? How, how so? Sure. How, how so? What do you I mean? I just meant, is there, is there sometimes, sometimes in nature, there's always the exception to the rule. There's always, like you said, it said most. Most cases, well, they are extremely predatory is, uh... and... Well, now some of those behaviors may seem um, non-predatorial, but they're simply scavenging. Uh, I'll give you I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the one of the recent posts that you posted on the website, uh, and everyone take a look at WilliamJevning.com, by the way, uh, the Ruby Creek incident, where Mrs. Chapman, the Indian I'll lady, and her children. Here. Yeah, the uh, that was. I mean. Obviously, the creatures knew they were had dried fish or there were other other food sources, and, and humans humans are sloppy. We because we collect food to make our lives easy, so we're not out hunting and gathering every day. We keep things around us, and and wildlife. Some wildlife knows that. I mean, it's the reason we have mice and rats and things like that because they know that we're a food supply. Well, there's no reason to believe that other animals don't know we're a food supply as well. You know, uh, especially homes where they're out. Uh, near wild areas where there's plenty of wildlife. Uh, and I know from growing up on a farm out in a very rural area uh, in western Washington, there was always, always some kind of, uh, uh, you know, wildlife coming in, whether to come after our, our livestock or, or the feed that was sitting out. And these guys are going to do the same thing. So I think in that case, and because she hid the children and left before the Sasquatch actually got there, we don't know what the intentions of that creature actually were. Uh, you know, taking the barrel of fish may have been just a, uh, you know, the second prize. We don't know what it was really after in that case. So sometimes there are stories that seem benign, but without knowing the context of the larger picture, especially behaviors that have been demonstrated previous to that particular incident, we don't really know what that creature's intentions were. So I don't know if that, I don't know if okay. that was a good answer yeah, or not. Uh, um, it, it sure no, is. it is because, uh, you know, I was just kind of thinking along the case that Nick, you know, Nick was just saying, you know, the case of the kid who fell into the gorilla pit and the alpha male protected him. Um, you know, maybe not so much. Protect I worked with David Sidden with uh, grizzly bears yeah, and brown yeah, bears yeah. and stuff like that for a while. And and while I was inside their pen where I was petting them and touching mm -hmm. them, you you still, you know, there was that there's that 
they're you know, exception to the rule where they could, yeah, because they are unpredictable, but they were not completely unpredictable. They were predictable up to a point. I mean, for the for the most part, you could go into the pen and you could feel yourself. You can feel that you were reasonably safe with them because yeah. of because the just how they were. Right, yeah, the, and that's the yeah, thing. The circumstances. You have to you have to look uh, at yeah. the uh, where the circumstances or the or the um, I, I can't think. You, the context. You have to look at the context of the situation. And and I'm oh, sorry, no. uh, Joe. That, let me get this real quick. That that's a great example of this whole money maker thing. Now, just because now those bears yeah. number one had the capability of tearing you limb from limb. But they didn't. So oh, you know, yeah. A plus B does not equal C all the time. You know what I mean? Yes. Mm-hmm. Go ahead, Joe. That, that little right. Kid That's a good point. He threat. didn't pose a threat. And the yeah. context of the situation was, you know, the gorillas have people around them all the time. Yeah. Uh, and, and in a situation like that, that's got to change how their behaviors are somewhat. I mean, it's got to be a modifying factor. I think Nick had something to say. Well, uh, how often do you think these things actually kill people? Uh, from what I learned of my sources, it's actually a lot more than anybody thinks. And most often, it's not It's not just the average person living in an area. It's most often people that are drifters. Uh, seasonal workers, people like that, are, that are get get into places who aren't from there. Locals don't know them, and consequently, you know, if they disappear, nobody really cares because they're not invested in the community enough to really uh, make a mark to be known by people. And and it's actually the numbers are actually quite high. I'm not going to quote any numbers to give my sources away, but yeah. they're actually much larger than anybody realizes. Ugh. So yes, it's not it's not a good situation. So when I caution people, and I tell them to use extreme caution, and Gerald knows this firsthand, when you go into the field where these things are, you, you know, I, I joke about this saying you might be setting yourself up to become a, a happy meal. It's not so happy for you. <laughs> it's just happy for them. Yeah, I, I'm not joking about that because it can and does happen. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't ever go out there thinking uh, from the exception, you know, the, you know, exception for the rule kind of a, a yeah. uh, of an attitude out there. No, as a matter of fact, when I go out, anytime I go out, um, I'm usually, I, I'm packing, yeah, I, I do, I, I pack a gun and, and I take the rest of my materials with me. Go well, ahead, Nick. Well, was well, that? Uh, every time... Every time I decide to to uh, to to go do some uh, quote quote uh, research, I'm always packing an AK, a handgun, and and basically, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'll tell you, if you've got a rifle in your hands or a sidearm that's visible. And, and this goes back again to that silly comment that, you know, they made on that show is, number one, they don't normally, as a matter of course, grab people and tear them apart, not because they're civilized, it's because they fear humans. We're, we are their top predator. Now, people might say, well, you know, we're, we're so much smaller and, and not physically adapted to the surroundings as they are, doesn't mean anything. Uh, human beings, how do you mean, if, if you really want to look at that, you have to analyze how we got to where we are on the food chain in this planet. Um, you know, when you look back at our history thousands of years ago, uh, scientists are now blaming us for the extinction of some megafauna because we went out and killed everything. Uh, and, and I've mentioned this before, it used to be in a lot of cultures, rite of passage uh, for a young boy to, or a, a boy to become a man by going out alone and finding the biggest, baddest creature out there and killing it. Yeah, but, uh, that was that was your proof. Now, why would something like that, I have to ask that question, why would something like that be so prevalent in in pre-civilized societies? It seems to be a, a, a normal thing across the board in cultures. Uh, I mean, there has to be some foundation for that. 
Everybody you know, something challenged. We are the most dangerous thing on Earth. Up until about, right, up until about 30 or 40 years ago, whenever animals in the forest would hear humans approaching, they'd run like crazy. And that's because we shot at everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, because, and because of the hippies and everything, since then, we don't. We don't go out and shoot just at everything anymore. So now they're starting to come in and not be so afraid. <laughs> oh, my dad used to tell me all the time if something comes in the yard, shoot it. You know, that was better. Yeah. And then when you came really? into this. I've been watching the news lately, and I don't know about you guys, but it sounds to me like everybody's got a gun and they're shooting everybody else. I don't know what. Well, they're shooting other people um, now. But I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Uh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. I, I, I had to feel sorry for uh, I we now where we lived it was a very rural area there were only five other farms in the surrounding area so everybody when you saw a car on the road you knew who wasn't home <laughs> right it, it was it was that sparsely populated and on Sundays this must have been early to mid 70s we used to get Jehovah's Witnesses <laughs> that would come driving in and that happened, you know, my, my mom <laughs> called them a couple of times, we're not interested, you know, because my family was Lutheran being Norwegians, you know, and, uh, you know, she'd tell them that, and, and you know, they would go away, but here they'd come right, right back in the next Sunday, so about the third time this happened, my dad took a 12-gauge shotgun, went out, fired off the car above their car and said, get off my damn property or I'll shoot you next time, and, uh, Consequently, the Jehovah's Witnesses never came back. Do you have time to talk to us about Odin? <laughs> my, my dad did some All colorful you things, let me tell you. <laughs> I went to Bible college. I invited him in the house. After that, they never come back, ever. Give him a good education. I just ask him, I keep asking him questions until they go, uh, uh. <laughs> My my, I have awesome. I have five sisters. You see, my dad did use the same approach with their boyfriends. <laughs> he just sort of grabbed them up when he first met them and told them if they they knocked up his daughter, he'd kill them. So <laughs> he was a big guy; nobody messed with him. So. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes. Uh... <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Um, you know, I've, I've, you know, I, I've been guilty of having that guilty pleasure of watching crazy Bigfoot shows and stuff like that. Oh, sure. it, you know, it's kind of like, it's like they say, I'm in marketing guys. And so for me, it's like, there's no such thing as bad plus publicity. Right. And I really don't think so. I think it's great for entertainment purposes and whatnot. However, I do think that some of the things that they do say on that, that show can, can really create some dangerous propositions Absolutely. for people. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you yeah. can't, see, yeah, yeah. It's you know, if it's going to sit there and be considered civilized, well, you know, what's it doing? You know, pulling out a dining room table, breaking out the China and then having mm. you for dinner, not over for dinner, but for dinner. For dinner right. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, so yeah, yeah go ahead. They, Nick. Show, they make these shows and act as if it's so safe for, for, for 10 year old kids to go out there and search they say oh it's so safe go out there and search kids it's all it's all yeah well sure they're they're trying to gather an audience yeah it, and and here's yeah the that's thing. like the one guy that i I met real quick, William. I met a guy who served, and he was just like, yeah, dude, I had a great white shark, a young one that came, you know, kind of swimming by me, and I was like, hey, dude, what's up? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no. Well, that's um, like the guy from Alaska. It's a shark, you idiot. That's like the guy from Alaska, <laughs> like, remember, with the grizzly bears. You know, him and his girlfriend were up there, and they ended up they ended up being bear poop. I mean, you know, sorry to, yeah. you know, kind of ask about it. that, but that's what happened. That's it. You that's know, you, you can't, and again, See, they, they, well, they everybody the likes to. This is a, this is kind of a human psychological trait. We like to put, uh, you know, it's, this is it's an anthropomorphic behavior, which means placing human traits on non-human species, and it's what we do. All we do with our cats and dogs all the time, you know. Well, the dog told me, you know, she didn't like her food or something. Really, the dog said that. <laughs> you know, I mean, 
Uh, <laughs> so it, it's just something so, we've got so in the habit of doing that uh, I think a lot of people do it without ever realizing, and, and they teach it right in preschool. You know, look how they teach kids. They use animals and things like that, and they and it, it's sort of ingrained at a very early age. And fortunately for us as a species, you know, we can get away with that because it doesn't depend on our survival to realize that things out there do not have our best interest at heart, you know, and, and could do grievous harm to us if we are in the wrong situation. So, and that's with just about any animal. There's, there's all kinds. I mean, heck, I had a weasel attack me one time. And uh, I don't know if it was rabbit or, or just a nasty little bugger, but it come charging out of, the, out of the tree line and my dog come racing in and, you know, that was it for the weasel. But uh, <clears throat> so animals, animals, depending on the circumstances, will do things that, you know, we don't think they're going to do because we've got the wrong concept in our minds about animal behaviors. And there's a, there's a good statement there you might want to read from uh, Stuber 035Q. Okay. Random thought. How many, times do you, how many times do you run into bears and no attack occurs, but no one would say they're benign just because the majority of the time people aren't attacked? We all know bears can be dangerous. Multiply the size, increased intelligence, and unknown mentalities of these things, the Sasquatch. I think it's safe to say they're very dangerous. It's a logical, it's a logical conclusion, yet the opposite is what's being put out in the mainstream. And that's exactly right. Uh, and it's because most people out there that you know have some name in the Bigfoot community or whatever, they keep putting this nonsense out. And probably the only good thing that the BFRO does on that television show is they they teach everybody to go out and bang on trees and scream and make all these stupid noises. Well, any self-respecting Sasquatch is going to run for the hills with all that stuff. So they're almost guaranteeing that no one is ever going to have one of these negative encounters, you know, by exhibiting that kind of behavior. Well, you always watch that show, Will, and they'll go, "Hey, did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, that was exactly. a squatch. <laughs> yeah, you never hear nothing." I, I guess, I, I guess, I, I that guess was you... probably Bobo farting. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had never watched the show, so I don't know about those things. <laughs> yeah, that was like, that's kind of crazy. I, I, that's the thing about that show was so my wife would make fun of me whenever I watched it because she was just like. So they find him. I'm like, yeah, yes, just be quiet. So, well, you know what? I'm I'm afraid to say that that type of show, you know, it's they have to uh, liken it to the Hollywood scene. And it's you know, unrealistic. The, yeah. the hippies, the flute player. Yeah. yeah. And that's why right. they're on TV, and they're and they're not. Well, now I, I think there's just people that don't know what we're doing yet, so maybe that's why we're not on. But uh, and you know we've talked about that. If because of the interest, now the the show that I, I was a co-host on, I'm not going to name that show, gained a lot of popularity because, and mainly because of the approach we took with the subject. When you show the subject in the real light. There's a hundred times more interest because you don't only get people in the Bigfoot community, you get everyone. You get people who are skeptics, and I prefer the skeptics myself. Uh, because skeptics, now here's here's the definition of skeptics. It's not the person that says, no, 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 there could be no Bigfoot, it doesn't exist. That's a debunker. A skeptic is somebody who's kind of on the fence, who's not going to support or really go against something. They're going to they're gonna weigh whatever evidence that comes in front of them. Uh, and Mark Dooley is a great example of that. Mark's a really sharp guy. Uh, he'll, he'll look at something and he'll listen to people, and when they talk nonsense, that's when he pounces on them. And that's either a supporter of the subject or somebody that's against it. it doesn't, he doesn't distinguish either way. He doesn't take sides. So real skeptics don't miss. Yeah, he, they don't really He's take a side. In. They're weighing what the evidence is, what's being presented. And if it sounds reasonable, they may support that. If it doesn't, then it's garbage. <laughs> I like oh. that. It's uh, you hear it's that? Post- it's the post production audio. <laughs> we'll add it later. I mean, no, it's I mean, it's money maker. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, that, that term squatch, that's one that always kind of drives me crazy. It did years ago when people start, first started using that. You know, I, I, I'm thinking, is, I, I used to joke, I'd say, what is that, some kind of a bowel movement or something? I have to squatch? I mean, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> Gone squatching. Sorry about that, folks. I yeah. I, I, used to be, I I was I used to be terrible when it come to that stuff. I in the field, you know, when we're not around anything being recorded. Even DeHinden was that way. He'd tell some real hilarious stories, and and some of the stuff that guy would say when we were away from any kind of recording device. <laughs> You know, so we have to be careful these days. Everybody has all kind of a phone in their pocket, and they're recording, you know, we're telling some some nasty story or something. <laughs> yeah. Nice. But you hey, know, let me read this one to you real quick yeah, from uh, Nick real quick, William. Um, <laughs> what's your opinion on the whole canine dog man phenomenon? Uh, he says, I believe there is something to it. Granted, I think there are two separate creatures, the type threes, which I think are more baboon and the canine dog man. Yeah, Mr. Black. And, and I, and like I said, I, I, I'll mention this to people. We have, I have probably, four to six different people or groups. I'm going to say groups because there are multiple people in some of these sources um, that are, are, or have been involved in certain aspects of the government dealing with this topic. And what I was told <clears throat> by someone who was in a, in a very good authority, very high position um, was when we talked about the four types and, and there may even be a fifth type, but uh, I'm not going to mess with that right now. I'm, having still to explain the four types, we have two major subgroup or two major groupings of these creatures. Okay. The type type ones and fours and the type twos and threes, the type ones and four are like what you see in the Patterson film. They have, and the main distinguishing features of those creatures from the other two types are the fact that they don't really have pronounced canines. <clears throat> they have flat kind of blocky looking teeth like we do. And they are predominantly walk upright on two legs. The type twos and threes uh, will go on all fours as often as they go on two legs, and they have very pronounced upper and lower canines. Uh, the type twos are more like the type one Patterson Sasquatch, except in terms of size and appearance, except uh, facially they're different. Uh, and, and we should probably put that picture, you know, from Vendramina that we had um, modified on the uh, Facebook page, but uh, so that's it's different than than the Patterson type Sasquatch facially, but the build and everything is very similar. And then the canines, that's a very very clear distinguishing feature of the two main species. Now the Type Three Dog Man is very similar to the Type Two, except uh, they have that elongated simian. Uh, protruding face, so, like Nick says, much more like a baboon. They're not, you know, they're not werewolves. There's no such thing as werewolves, things like that. Uh, there's too many people who watch a lot of movies and TVs and come up with these fantasies. They probably see these type three creatures, and then they all of a sudden they make the assumption, they make the money maker leap that A plus B equals, you know, Z or some crazy thing like that. Uh, and it's not, not that the people are crazy. It's just some of these ideas are, are too readily available to make that quick assumption without really digging into what facts there are before making an assumption. So I hope that, I hope that was clear, Nick. <laughs> I, I'm going to try to put together. Go ahead, Gerald. You know, sometimes uh, I was going to say Pertaining to that BFRO, yeah. they put out some pretty bad information. I remember watching it one time. I, the, the the gentleman that lives in Portland, Oregon. Which one's that now? The Do you remember his name? Well, the the gentleman on that BFRO not, show we're not that about Ray uh, Crow, from Portland. No. Oh, he's, he's on, on the, the uh, Bigfoot hunting Bigfoot show. The guy from Portland. Oregon. Yeah, I was listening. They put out some bad information at times because there's a, la a lady that had one in her yard. And and this guy actually looked at her and says, hey, you should be happy that they're there. They'll never hurt you, you know. And then, and he's putting forth this type of information. I'm going, man, that's mm -hmm. that's totally – that that's irrational. And, and, and well, I, it's – part and they're using – and unfortunately, they're using a platform, a medium – 
such as the television show to spread misinformed ideas about this topic. These are people who don't really know. You know, they think they know because they, they belong to the BFRO. So all of a sudden they're, you know, some kind of half-baked experts and they run out there and they're telling all this nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. When you go back and again, you know, people, I, I we brought this up, I think last week when people were talking about uh, like some of the old uh, stories that we put on blog posts on the website. People need to look at the history. If you want to know anything about really any topic is you look at the history. Remember the old saying, you know, if you ignore history, you're doomed to repeat it. Well, that holds true with this topic. If, you know, their behavior is not going to change according to our outlook about them. Their behavior is their behavior. And the way to learn about that behavior is to look at the historical accounts. And you can look at all those stories and, and the good ones, and there's a very common thread throughout those in terms of behavioral characteristics. So <clears throat> these guys, uh, there isn't any of that touchy-feely stuff out there. And the, maybe there's a very few. Now, there was an example, one story, I think John Green had his book, where, uh, and I can't remember if the guy was hunting or what he was doing out in a forested area and apparently broke his leg and he passed out from the pain. Well, he was found near, and apparently he saw, he saw one of these creatures and I, and I don't remember if that's how he broke his leg, you know, somehow involved in the sighting or whatever. But anyway, the circumstances where he broke his leg, uh, he apparently saw this creature, then he passed out, not a good situation, but he, he woke up uh, in close proximity to a cabin and some people. And so the assumption was made that the creature picked him up and carried him and put him where he'd be found by people. Uh, and the truth is nobody really looked into it. So nobody knows how he got to that location, or it could have been a case where like we know about tacky psyche, where under extreme duress, uh, a combination severe injury with a sighting of a creature that would be so far outside of your frame of reference that it causes, it's a survival mechanism for your, your mental processes. And it could have driven that witness to, you know, sort of fabricate things or black out. He may very well have gotten to the location where he woke up uh, on his own. You know, we, nobody knows. I mean, there's way too many things. You can't just, again, you know, do A plus B equals C. It doesn't, it, just because it might look that way doesn't mean that that's what it was. Correct. Hi, Sarah. Nick was, uh, Nick put up there also, he says, the problem Sweet. is I'm <laughs> hearing tons of stories of people describing canine legs and a bushy tail. Um, you know, I, I still have a really hard time. I mean, they're seeing something that's not what these creatures are. You know, there, there's something that's when, when you're going to really do a serious investigation. And again, I, and, and this is something I, I was reading today. I'm, I'm doing the next, uh, for anyone we, we didn't really talk about the Bigfoot Fieldwork 101, the 10 volume series. Uh, we're making the videos that are going to be posted on the website, williamjevening.com. And there's going to be a book, a companion book for each one of those videos. So there's going to be 10 books. Uh, the first one's already published. It's uh, Bigfoot Fieldwork 101, Volume 1, Equipment. And, and these are for beginners. Or if you had been involved in this stuff, then, um, uh, you know, you might look at that book and, and maybe there's something in there you hadn't thought of getting. The next book is in edit right now. That's the one on choosing a research area. And I'm working on the third one right now that's uh, interviewing witnesses. And here's, and here's a little preview. When, when most people interview witnesses, and this is a big thing, they do it by use of what's called an intuitive means. In other words, yeah, even, even, a lot of, even a lot of police, and Gerald, you're, you're a former police officer. Uh, I'm sure you, in the academy you probably got some training on interviewing but a lot of times you sort of went with your gut interviewing. Is that right? Right. Sure, so the who, what, where, when, when, why, you know? especially with this topic, you know, people are out there going by the seat of their pants. There isn't any real uh, training that goes along with it. And here's a problem with interviewing, especially this topic. And, and I'm sure you'll agree. 
is when you, you're trying to get to the bottom of it, some information, some report, some incident that happened, uh, you never want you never want to lead a witness. In other words, you, 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 people in the subject will say, uh, and I've heard people do this. They'll say, well, what did the Bigfoot you saw look like? What color was it? Wrong answer. Yeah. Because instantly the person is formulating an image in their mind and they're trying to live up to the expectations because it's sort of a, a as an, an interviewer, you're, whether you're, it's a real authority position or not, you're setting yourself up in a position of authority. And people are trying to live up to that, uh, the expectation of that position of authority. So uh, you don't ever want to be in that position interviewing on this topic, especially because you want, you want as base information as you can get about that person's encounter. So it, you would say, I would say something like, well, tell me, tell me what happened. What, what happened? What were you doing prior to this incident that you related to me uh, and lead me into the events that unfolded? You know, give them an open-ended question. Yeah, give them an open-ended question. That's let them fill in the blanks. Because if, and, and I think this happens all the time with, um, with some of these reports, you know, and again, it goes back to maybe what, what Nick was asking there or saying that he gets a lot of these reports. I, I don't know what these people interviewing are asking, but it doesn't take very much information for the witness to all of a sudden start and I, they're not doing it on purpose. I don't think most times. I think they're. Um, uh, oh, let me let me read this. Uh, Nick says I'm open to both subjects. I thought it was all hogwash until my good friend Jody Cook showed me a cast he took in Western Ohio. There are no bears in Western Ohio. This has to be. Uh, it moved. <laughs> Too big to be a dog. The monsters. Well, now. One thing, Nick, there are, and I, and I think a lot of people don't realize this, there are a lot of wolves being reintroduced around the country and just coming back in naturally. And a wolf, of course, is much larger. Uh, I've got a, a connection up in, in British Columbia who told me that uh, it's common for wolves to be 250 pounds. And he showed me, sent me pictures of wolves that they've shot. They're, they're enormous. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's very possible um, you know, in this case, you know, if they're casting tracks of something that's dog-like, it, it is, these, this has, this topic has nothing to do with Bigfoot and the four types, you know, and it's very likely if they're reporting dog legs and bushy tails, they're seeing a wolf and probably very large ones. And I would think, especially today, they're getting large because nobody's out killing them off and they have lots of food to eat. I tell you what, I can show you the track <laughs> on my dog, and you'd be freaked out. I'm not kidding you. Hey, but, uh, yeah. To get back to your interviewing, I think it's important Absolutely. to build a rapport with the person. You know, uh, let them get yeah. comfortable with you. Read them. If they're uncomfortable, you're not going to get much information out of anybody who's uncomfortable with you. But if you approach them in a manner, you know that that you care. You're really interested Absolutely. in the person. Find out about that person. You know, long before you start asking questions about the Bigfoot or whatever they've seen. You know, how long they've lived there in that area. You know, find out their background, what they did for work. You know, just get to know them so that, they, you know, then they can get comfortable with you because right. then they can see that you actually care about them. You know, you're not there to get a story or get, or get a quick interview so you can throw it on a piece of paper. Uh, because then you're, that person's going to get comfortable and then they're going to be willing to open and, up. And, and that's the thing, honest. you know, I, I've found interviewing people over the years, uh, you know, you got to chit chat with them and let them know. I let them know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm just, just like you. I'm just a regular guy out here looking around, but I, I'm doing this. And, um, I, and, and I always like using the example of the Goldhammer family in uh, Yakult, Washington, when back in 89, when their incident happened, uh, there had been several individuals and groups of so-called researchers that went to their farm ahead of me, even though I lived in the area. Some of these people raced down there from Seattle as soon as they got wind of the newspaper article. And uh, so when I went there, I, you know, I figured whatever, whatever evidence was there was probably gone or trampled on or, or something had happened to it. So I sort of went in, as I do with most incidents, with the approach that, well, let me 
let me talk to the people and, I, and you ought to be got to be got to care about the people because first of all they've had a very traumatic experience and and having had that traumatic experience myself and you know yourself because you've had this also uh when you approach someone else that's had a very similar experience with these things they're pretty shook up and and the first thing I usually tell them is, hey, I, I, I yep. know what you're going through. I had this happen to my to myself. You know, I know exactly how you feel right now because I've been there. And, and you never really lose that feeling. So, like you said, you establish rapport and, and that works every time. And, you, and, and they know if, if somebody went out that's never had this experience and tried to do this, they can, they can see through it instantly. We all, all of us that have had this traumatic experience with these things, can tell at a moment's notice if somebody else is lying about an encounter normally. Uh, now I have, I have been around people who told a pretty good story and uh, you know, because there were other things going on, I didn't question a lot of it. I let it go until I found out overwhelming evidence later that their story was fabricated. Then I cut off any contact with people like that. So, and, and Gerald knows what I'm talking about. So we won't mention names or any, any kind of connection, but, uh, it does happen sometimes. What's that? Yeah, water under the bridge, right? Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, and you water know, under the bridge, and especially right? with older, older stories. I mean, now, like with the gold hammer thing, it had just happened a few days before I went there, so that's a fairly fresh incident. Uh, as opposed to somebody who, like you know, and I'll say, um, uh, you know, the, a made-up story. Usually a made up story has a lot of detail, you know, a lot more detail than what should happen. Normally stories that happen are fairly have about the same amount of information in them. Um, so when a story has a lot of detail and you look at the history of this topic and you can go back in a lot of like John Green's books and, and others and read these accounts and, and they're all kind of similar. There's not while there might in, in the written form, it looks like a lot of detail, but when you're telling, uh, when you're telling a story verbally, it's not very long. Uh, so anyway, getting back to that, uh, you know, there, there are things that come up and, and the stories a lot of times are old and like the ones that I've talked about that were, and I know a few of them that were fake were older stories had happened a year or more before the person related them to me. So I was unable to go and verify any of the information. Whereas a, a recent story, uh, you know, you can go out there and, uh, and verify things or, um, oh, <laughs> let me get, read what, what this deal is. I think when dudes show up wearing big features, proudly saying who and what they are, cough, BFRO, cough, <laughs> in such a fringe topic, you can instantly put people off. We need quiet professionals in this field. And, and that's a good point. Uh, and that's what we do. I mean, now we, we have our shirts. I put them on the, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Facebook page today, but the difference is our shirts don't say anything about Bigfoot. They say Jevning Research, and and I've used since 2003 the symbol of a compass. Uh, and I know I'm going off topic a little bit, but that's what we do on this on this chat. So, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, oh, the when I when I first came up with that logo, and and I reason I'm I'm going through all this is because you know Meldrum and uh, the Muppet guy. You know, they created what they called Bigfoot North Radio a year or two ago, and it was a big flop, and they stole my image for their show. Uh, they knew that they knew it was mine because I had it out there in the public. So, uh, and if they're listening, I don't care. You know, you stole my you stole my image, and now I'm you know I've been using it all along, so I'm still going to continue to use it. But it was an inside joke originally, and I made I come up with the compass because. This subject has no direction whatsoever. <laughs> Anybody who comes in this comes up with their own theory and off they go in all these different directions. So it was an inside joke between myself and some friends. And, uh, but the image looks really good. You know, anybody who wants to see it can go on, uh, you know, the Facebook page and take a look at some of the, uh, the shirts and hats and things that I come up with, you know, as, as a, as a, suggestion to our members, if they wanted to, you know, go on Vista print or, or I think Joe, uh, De Hoyo, uh, 
one of our members in Texas has uh, contacts or is involved in, in printing shirts and things. So we were discussing, you know, the possibility of making them for our members if they want them. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about Bigfoot. You know, we don't go rolling into places saying, hey, you know, we're big time Bigfoot hunters. Uh, and again, it's it's a very, almost every case, it's very traumatic. Even if the person, the witnesses had uh, incidents that maybe weren't quite so direct, uh, maybe they just heard screams or something. Um, they, uh, you know, it's still a traumatic event. If they, once they realized what was there, it, it scares the heck out of them. So uh, it, you have to approach people in that fashion. You can't just come blazing in there thinking you're big time experts and all this stuff. That's just nonsense. There's no way to treat people. Uh, and the first thing I would recommend is treat people the way you would want to be treated. If you're going to go interview people, put yourself in their shoes and look at yourself, how you approach them. And, 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 you know, and, and you, and oftentimes right. I've made up some, uh, I've made some very great friends along the way who were witnesses. And then, yeah, I mean, I have see you're, and you're one Gerald. I mean, uh, you guys had your things happen there and, you know, but, and even in the gold armor case and some older ones, you know, uh, you know, I, say I feel that I feel everyone's pain that's had an encounter with these things because I've been there I've been in their shoes you know I ran into a guy his name's Ray I'm not going to mention his last name but he lives out there pretty close to the yeah, Carson right. uh, Steelhead Hatchery you might know who I'm talking about okay. he uh, is a logger and I was buying wood from him this year and being so he lives in that area, I wanted to kind of come around the corner with him, you know, and uh, kind of hit him up. But I wanted to come approach him mm -hmm. in a manner as yeah. what we were suffering or, or going through. Up there. And uh, we started talking, and, and what a just a neat gentleman, he really, really is. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I came on. I told him, I said, Ray, I said. Uh, you don't mind i'd like to ask you a question and he, asked, he goes well what is that? i go well we've been having some problems and we've been being harassed you know and he looked at me kind of strange like who's yeah. harassing you and i so i told him and you know what he goes yeah you're not the only one he said you're not the only one and he started telling oh, yeah. me about situations at that campground that's just i, I can tell you Place and the I hatchery. can tell you, not far from I that hatchery, this was probably back, it was early 90s, 91, 92, somewhere in that time frame, I got a, I got a report of a sighting up, up that road, just up from the hatchery, less than a mile, and, uh, and, and this is kind of along the topic of odors, and I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the field, and there's been very, very seldom that I can honestly say that I smelled something that I w might have considered one of these creatures because, you know, I pretty few you're out in the outdoors, you get familiar with what's out there and what things smell like. Uh, on this occasion, it was raining very lightly. This was in the, I think it was in the fall. It could have been the spring. I, I don't remember the exact time frame, but it was, it was in a time when all the leaves were off the trees and, uh, and it was kind of chilly and wet. So uh, my buddy Jack and I decided to park before the area where the sighting was reported and we decided to walk, you know, in case, so we could see if there was any sort of evidence around without destroying it with the vehicle. Uh, as we walked along, we walked directly into a wall of stink. I can't even begin to describe. It made us both want to vomit. It was that powerful. And I just said, let's just keep going. And we covered our mouths and we walked out of it. And it wasn't, and it was in a very narrow area. It wasn't very big, maybe 30 feet. We walked into it, we gagged, and we walked out of it. And we walked on up the road about 100 yards or so. And I said, you know, if there was something, if there was something in there that was decaying, because it wasn't really decay, it was, I can't describe it. It was a combination of odors. It was animal smell. It was decay. It was, uh, you know, a mixture of I things. So, yeah, I was totally unfamiliar with it. So when we walked back to that spot moments later, the odor was completely gone. The air was clean. And I said, there you go. Something was right here, just out of our sight in the tree line, and it left. So I walked into the spot, 
and we found it was just really heavy moss. You know how that area is, right? There's really thick moss on hard packed ground. And you could see where the moss was pushed down by something very heavy. You now, you know how moss is in that area. It takes a lot of weight to push that down where you can see something was there. And, and the, ground was still, the ground was still warm where it was pressed down. Absolutely. And I couldn't make out any markings. It was, you know, it was a couple feet around. It was wow. big. But it, uh, whatever was there, stunk like hell. It was observing us. And as soon as we walked on, it departed. And when we came back, it was gone. So... I don't know where we were going with that. Oh, it was the same area that you were just talking about with this uh, guy Ray. <clears throat> but that area's had a long area, of, a long time of activity in there. Oh yeah, it, it really has. I've heard. I've had a couple of people. I know a few people that are very oh, that, that have seen it. that area. Uh, that area has always been very active up there. Absolutely, and that's such a, a tremendous wilderness area. Oh, it is. Know? Yeah, it's, it's just beautiful, just beautiful. Yeah, but I tell you what, you better have some legs underneath your body. That's Gary, that's a steep. <laughs> that's steep country. <laughs> that's about steep country in there. Nice. I told, I went up there, up there the back was <laughs> When I was in my early thirties, I, I tromped all over that country. But uh, <laughs> you know, at this at this age, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> There's either gonna be a horse or some kind of vehicle under me getting uh, me around those places. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm getting too old to be nice. doing all that stuff. I mean, not not that I won't go out there. Yeah, not that I won't go out there, but That's I'm not going to hike my old butt around some of that woods anymore. I'm not going to set myself up to be a happy meal. <laughs> oh my God. It, I'm telling you, it is nasty. I, I'm talking oh, like yeah. 65 oh, to 85 percent. Yeah, I don't, I don't have you know, any desire to be nasty. tagged and bagged. <laughs> hey, anybody who's familiar with nice. uh, mountaineering I, terms? Uh, so a friend of mine who was uh, a mountain climber told me once that that's what they that's what they call it. If somebody's climbing and they can't make it any further, they'll put them in their sleeping bag and they'll they'll kind of anchor them to a spot and they tag them in case the person passes out or whatever, and then they collect them up on the way back. So if you're bagged and tagged, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have no intention nice. of becoming, you know, a wrapped, you know, I don't, I don't want to be a, 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 a burrito or anything, a Bigfoot burrito out there. So. Um, William, do you want to, do you want to mention what's mention. happening next week? So everybody knows. Yeah. Uh, with the holidays and everything. Uh, of course we've been doing the past two shows on Wednesdays. Uh, next week I'm, taking my first vacation in the past six years. So uh, we're heading out of town for a week. So uh, David and Gerald, and I'm not sure if uh, uh, who else, if Reggie's going to be on or who else is going to be on, but you guys will be doing the show without me next week. Uh, and I'm not sure what you guys are going to talk about yet. We'll come up with something between now and um, then. But, uh, actually, I had to mute myself and get off of here and put a little card over the camera because I just got a call from an individual in uh, over near the Oregon coast. Oh, um, really? And I have a lot of really good information. I will also be sharing uh, updates awesome. from here in Southern Oregon of recent Very this good. year over the last six months of uh, a family um, being kind of buggered a little bit uh, with uh, a possible multi um, Bigfoot in the area. Right, so, and, um, and a little background on that awesome. is before he contacted me originally some time ago, uh, we found out there was actually a history of activity, recent activity going on around that part of town. It was on the north side, and it was through some of this, uh, some of this inside information that I was in contact with at the time and we knew that uh, the feds knew about this, and apparently at some point they drove them out of there, but it was temporary because they did come back. And that, that's the way it is sometimes with these creatures. So uh, and for those who don't know, uh, David isn't just our, our super sharp tech guy and, and marketer and everything. He's also our leader in Oregon. So uh, David will be updating what's going on in the field 
And uh, I guess we're, well, we're just about out of time, fellas. I think we should wrap this up and, and call it good. Yeah, you. the uh, pod. Quick for Nick. Nick, um, what I'm doing is kind of helping William put together something that will start out in sometime around February or March, where we will have a private show um this will be a members only kind of a deal um but it will be coming out around the end of february beginning of march at some point he's actually going to start as soon as he gets back from his vacation well he's going to have start uh, doing some recordings we're going to build those up for a while put them into the system so that way you guys have at least some sort of base of six to eight like already done you know hour and a half little slots so that you guys have some some good stuff to uh, you know stories and encounters to listen in on. Um, so this is going to be very coolly formatted. Uh, it's going to have all the fancy intro to it. It's going to be a lot like kind of what you're you've already heard from Mister you know uh, Jevning over the last you know couple years at, at another place online. It's going to be very very similar to that kind of format. Yeah. Um, except for here, it's going to be some straight up good old truth talking, speaking stories and encounters from uh, real people. So it's going to be really awesome. And I'm kind of thinking that a part of that, we'll do a little, maybe a little discussion after the interview of the witnesses. Uh, and I mentioned Mark Dooley, our resident skeptic. Mark wants to come on with me. And uh, now Mark isn't just going to pick people apart. That's not what's going to happen. Uh, what he's going to do is provide kind of that fresh view from someone who isn't either pro or con on the topic, you know, to kind of help me, uh, you know, he wants to help look at situations, you know, with, with a more um, antiseptic view, I would say, you know, not, not, not that we're just going to totally say, Oh yeah, we heard that noise. That was Bigfoot, obviously, you know, because Mark, I'm not that kind of person and Mark's not that kind of person. So, uh, and Mark, Mark has, has a lot of humor, so we're going to have humor on it. So a little joking around and stuff. So, uh, yeah. we're, and we're next still kinda... week, <clears throat> next week, real quick, William, um, guys, we'll, we'll be hosting the blab on my blab channel. So go ahead and right. follow me on blab. So you get the update. I will also put it on the website on the live stream page. So you'll see that. And uh, I'm going to have Gerald here. Hopefully, Gerald will be able to join us. And uh, yeah, maybe found, another person or two from the spot. field would be great. I found your blab spot, David. While I'm trying to get I've back actually, to you. I have. I have two of them, so you have to you have to follow the one that says D Boozman here. The other one is for a network marketing gig I do, and I talk MLM there all day. Um, this one right here, D Boozman, is my internet marketing channel, but at the same time, I use it for you know all kinds of cool stuff. So um, D Boozman is the handle, so that's the one you follow. Awesome. Awesome. All right, fellas. Well, let's wrap it up for the evening. Thanks for everyone for joining us and. Uh, Join the fellows next week. I'll be off in San Diego enjoying myself. So uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Music the end of now, Will. Right, everyone. <laughs> this is blab. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Night, everyone. We should probably put that picture, you know, from Vendramina that we had. Um, modified on the uh, Facebook page, but um, so that's it's different than than the Patterson type Sasquatch facially, but the build and everything is very similar, and then the canines that's a very very clear distinguishing feature of the two main species. Now the Type Three Dog Man is very similar to the Type Two, except uh, they have that elongated simian. Uh, protruding face, like Nick says, much more like a baboon. They're not, you know, they're not werewolves. There's no such thing as werewolves, things like that. Uh, there's too many people who watch a lot of movies and TVs and come up with these fantasies. They probably see these type three creatures, and then they all of a sudden make the assumption, they make the money maker leap that A plus B equals, you know, Z or some crazy thing like that. Uh, and it's not, not that the people are crazy. It's just some of these ideas are, are too readily available to make that quick assumption without really digging into what facts there are before making an assumption. So I hope that, I hope that was clear, Nick. <laughs> I, I'm going to try to put together. Go ahead, Gerald. You know, sometimes uh, I was going to say, 
pertaining to that BFRO, yes. they put out some pretty bad information. I remember watching it one time. I, the, the the gentleman that lives in Portland, Oregon. Which one's that now? The Do you remember his name? Well, he, the the gentleman on that BFRO not, show we're not that about uh, Ray Crow, from are Portland. We? No. Oh, he's, he's on, on the, the show? Uh, Bigfoot hunting Bigfoot show. The guy from Portland. Yeah, I was listening. They put out some bad information at times because there's a, a lady that had one in her yard, and and this guy actually looked at her and says, "Hey, you should be happy that they're there. They'll never hurt you, you know." And then, and he's putting forth this type of information. I'm going, man, that's mm -hmm. that's totally that that's irrational. And, and and well, I, it's part and they're it, using and unfortunately they're it, using a platform, a like medium. That such as to the television show to spread misinformed ideas about this topic. These are people who don't really know, you know, they think they know because they, they belong to the BFRO. So all of a sudden they're, you know, some kind of half baked experts and they run out there and they're telling all this nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. When you go back and again, you know, people, I, I we brought this up, I think last week when people were talking about, uh, like some of the old uh, stories that we put on blog posts on the website. People need to look at the history. If you want to know, it's not, it's not just the average person living in an area. It's most often people that are drifters, uh, seasonal workers, people like that are, that are get, get into places who aren't from there. Locals don't know them. And consequently, you know, if they disappear, nobody really cares because they're not invested in the community enough to really, uh, make a mark to be known by people. And, and it's actually, the numbers are actually quite high. I'm not going to quote any numbers to give my sources away, but yeah. they're actually much larger than anybody realizes. Ugh. So yes, it's not, it's not a good situation. So when I caution people and I tell them to use extreme caution and Gerald knows this firsthand, when you go into the field where these things are, you, you know, I, I joke about this saying you might be setting yourself up to become a, a happy meal. It's not so happy for you. <laughs> it's not happy for them. Yeah, I, I'm not joking about that because it can and does happen. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't ever go out there thinking uh, from the exception, you know, the, you know, exception for the rule kind of a, a yeah. uh, of an attitude out there. No, as a matter of fact, when I go out, anytime I go out, um, I'm usually, I, I'm yeah, packing. Yeah. I, I do. Oh, I, I pack I a gun an and, on me. and I take the rest of my materials with me. Go oh, ahead, Nick. Well, was well, that? Uh, every time, every time I decide to, to, uh, to, to go do some, uh, quote, quote a research i'm always packing an ak a handgun and, mm -hmm. and basically uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah well and i'll tell you if you've got a rifle in your hands or a sidearm that's visible and and this goes back again to that silly comment that you know they made on that show is number one they don't normally as a matter of course, grab people and tear them apart, not because they're civilized, it's because they fear humans. We're, we are their top predator. Now, people might say, well, you know, we're, we're so much smaller and, and not physically adapt to the surroundings as they are, doesn't mean anything. Uh, human beings, how do you mean, if, if you really want to look at that, you have to analyze how we got to where we are on the food chain in this planet. Um, you know, when you look back at our history thousands of years ago, uh, scientists are now blaming us for the extinction of some megafauna because we went out and killed everything. Uh, and, and I've mentioned this before. It used to be in a lot of cultures, a rite of passage uh, for a young boy to, or a, a boy to become a man by going out alone. No evidence in, the, in some time now. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to talk about that publicly. I'll let you know privately what to look for and where to go. Okay, sure. sure. It, it, I don't want to give stuff away publicly because all the the people out there I don't Ooh, think no. deserve <laughs> to know how to find these things. I don't want them doing it. Okay, yeah, sure. 
There's Gerald. He's back. We were just talking about you. Oh, yeah. How are we all today? Well, Dave said to push that thing over there, and I did it, and I went. <laughs> and there you went. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, that was the wrong thing to push. <laughs> are you on a – yeah, unless you're on a smartphone. Oh. <laughs> no, that's right. Don't. <laughs> I have a dumb Let's phone. <laughs> nice. <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me throw this topic out there that um, – a few days ago, and I, I sent you guys messages about this, you know, to think about, but uh, a friend on Facebook posted a comment, apparently Matt Moneymaker on their show, Finding Bigfoot, made the comment that since since Bigfoot is capable of ripping the arms and legs off people, uh, now this is, this is secondhand information, so it's not a quote, but I, I trust the source since she was watching the show and... and Posted the comment, not to me, but it was made directly on Facebook. Uh, but since Sasquatches apparently have the ability to pull people apart limb by limb, but don't, they must be civilized. What? <laughs> no, he just went full. He, he just went See, full. Full potato there. He just went absolutely full. Oh my God! Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there's. Let's look at it. I mean, there's, there's lots of animals that have the capability of doing harm to other animals or people, but just because they don't doesn't mean they're civilized. You know, that's that's a very, it's a very shallow, yeah, form of thinking when it comes to wildlife and, and behaviors. You know, you know, and I, I don't, I don't know if it was. Oh, go ahead. I, the people who are watching that show are are idiots. I'm sorry. Seriously. Well, I think there's there's such a lack. I think there's such a lack of you know. There's a great interest in the topic, yeah. but there's a lack of real good programming out there for it. There's nothing that really presents the topic no. in in its yeah. real form. Uh, you know, killing uh, the the show called the uh, killing move through it. So. Uh, you know, he, he happened to get lucky. There was a little bit of activity reported in that area, and I was able to put him right on onto the group, but they've since vanished. So that's on that's a natural part of movement. Uh, our teams in New York, we've actually got some pretty good stuff going on in the state of New York right now. We have three teams, uh, of course, Jeremiah and I uh, in the Andriondack Mountains and uh, Gail Beatty who's in the Hudson River Valley. And uh, Dave Gibson and his wife Pam, they're in that also that northern region. All through, all three of those belong to the Jevening Research Group now, and we just appointed Jeremiah as the uh, regional manager for that whole part of the country since he's he's a real go-getter. He does a great job, and uh, oh, <laughs> I just got a message from uh, Gerald. Gerald says, trying to find my way back. Mom is helping. So <laughs> we, can, we, nice. we can talk bad about him while he's not here. So so other than that, um, you know, again, with the holidays, a lot of our people around the country are off doing things. There he is. They're off doing things. So uh, we, haven't, we haven't got a whole lot to report right now other than there are things happening in the field, and but there's very few people out, people out actually looking right at the moment. Oh, uh, 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 Will. Yeah. How do you go and uh, track them? Because I haven't seen no evidence in the, in some time now. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to talk about that publicly. I'll let you know privately what to look for and where to go. Okay, sure, sure. It, if, I don't want to give stuff away publicly because all the the people out there I don't Ooh, think no. deserve <laughs> to know how to find these things. I don't want them doing it. Okay. Yeah, sure. There's Gerald. He's back. Well, we were just talking good. about you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah like, how are we all today? Well, Dave said to push that thing over there, and I did it, and I went. <laughs> and there you went. <laughs> Apparently, that was the wrong thing to push. 
<laughs> uh, are you on a? Yeah, unless you're on a smartphone. Oh <laughs> no, that's right. Don't. <laughs> I have a dumb Let's phone. <laughs> nice. Let me let me let me throw this topic out there that um, a few days ago, and I I sent you guys messages about this, you know, to think about. But uh, a friend on Facebook posted a comment. Apparently, Matt Moneymaker on their show finding Bigfoot made the comment that since the 10 volume series, uh, we're making the videos that are going to be posted on the website, williamjevening.com. And there's going to be a book, a companion book for each one of those videos. So there's going to be 10 books. Uh, the first one's already published. It's uh, Bigfoot Fieldwork 101, volume one equipment. And, and these are for beginners. Or if you're had been involved in this stuff, then, um, uh, you know, you might look at that book and, and maybe there's something in there you hadn't thought of getting. The next book is in edit right now. That's the one on choosing a research area. And I'm working on the third one right now that's uh, interviewing witnesses. And here's and here's a little preview. When, when most people interview witnesses, and this is a big thing, they do it by use of what's called an intuitive means. In other words, yeah, even, even a lot of even a lot of police, and Gerald, you're, you're a former police officer. Uh, I'm sure you in the academy, you probably got some training on interviewing, but a lot of times you sort of went with your gut interviewing. Is that right? Right. Sure, so it's just the who, what, where, when, when, people when, why. You know? Especially with this topic, you know, people are out there going by the seat of their pants. There isn't any real uh training that goes along with it. And here's a problem with interviewing, especially this topic, and, and I'm sure you'll agree, is when you, you're trying to get to the bottom of it, some information, some report, some incident that happened, uh, you never want you never want to lead a witness. In other words, you, 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 people in the subject will say, uh, and I've heard people do this, they'll say, well, what did the Bigfoot you saw look like? What color was it? Wrong answer. Yep. Because instantly the person is formulating an image in their mind and they're trying to live up to the expectations because it's sort of a, a as an, an interviewer, you're, whether you're, it's a real authority position or not, you're setting yourself up in a position of authority. And people are trying to live up to that, the expectation of that position of authority. So uh, you don't ever want to be in that position interviewing on this topic, especially because you want you want as base information as you can get about that person's encounter. So it, you would say I would say something like, "Well, tell me tell me what happened. What what happened? What were you doing prior to this incident that you related to me, uh, and lead me into the events that unfolded? You know, give them an open ended question. Yeah, give them an open ended question. That's Let them fill in the blanks because if and and I think this happens all the time." with um with some of these reports you know and again it goes back to maybe what what nick was asking there or saying that he gets a lot of these reports i i don't know what these people interviewing are asking but it doesn't take very much information for the witness to all of a sudden they start and i'm there and i made i come up with a compass because this subject has no direction whatsoever <laughs> anybody who comes in this comes up with their own theory and off they go in all these different directions so it was an inside joke between myself and some friends, and uh, but the image looks really good. You know, anybody who wants to see it can go on, uh, you know, the Facebook page and take a look at some of the uh, the shirts and hats and things that I come up with. You know, as as a as a suggestion to our members if they wanted to, you know, go on Vistaprint or or I think Joe uh, De Hoyo, uh, one of our members in Texas has uh, contacts or is involved in, in printing shirts and things. So we were discussing, you know, the possibility of making them for our members if they want them. Uh, but it doesn't say anything about Bigfoot. You know, we don't go rolling into places saying, Hey, you know, we're big time Bigfoot hunters. Uh, and again, it's, it's a very, almost every case, it's very traumatic. Even if the person, the witnesses had uh, incidents that maybe weren't quite so direct uh, maybe they just heard screams or something. Um, they, uh, you know, it's still a traumatic event. If they once they realized what was there, it, it scares the heck out of them. So uh, it, you have to approach people in that fashion. You can't just come blazing in there, thinking you're 
big time experts and all this stuff. That's just nonsense. There's no way to treat people. Uh, and the first thing I would recommend is treat people the way you would want to be treated. If you're going to go interview people, put yourself in their shoes and look at yourself, how you approach them. And, 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 you know, and, and you, and oftentimes right. I've made up some, uh, I've made some very great friends along the way who were witnesses. And then, yeah, I mean, I have so you're, and you're one, Gerald. I mean, uh, you guys had your things happen there and, you know, but, and even in the gold armor case and some older ones, you know, uh, you know, I say, I feel that I feel everyone's pain that's had an encounter with these things because I've been there. I've been in their shoes. You know, I ran into a guy, his name's Ray. I'm not going to mention his last name. But he lives out there pretty close to the yeah, Carson right. uh, Steelhead Hatchery. You might know who I'm talking about. Okay. He uh, is a logger, and I was buying wood from him this year. And being though he lives in that area, I wanted to kind of come around the corner with him, you know, and uh, kind of hit him up. But I wanted to come approach him mm -hmm. in a manner as yeah. what we were suffering or, or going through up there. And uh, we started talking, and, and what a just a neat gentleman, he really, really is. And uh, I, you know, I, I, I came on. I told him, I said, Ray, I said, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a question. Divided my attention. Multitasking. <laughs> I know. I, I sat down. I was sitting down all day, all day today, just focusing on. I, I was spending a lot of time on the new um, uh, Facebook group page. That uh, David, why don't you go ahead and. T talk about that again before we get rolling here. Yeah, sure thing. You guys uh, over here, uh, there's a link right there you can click on. Open up another window right now. You can go there and, and click on join up in the right-hand corner. <laughs> well done. Well yeah. done. <laughs> Those are my internet savvy people. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, you guys can uh, uh, click on that link right there. It'll open up another window, and you guys can join the group there. This is going to be uh, – right now it's open and public for everyone. People can share there. Me and uh, William will actually be in there um, uh, kind of uh, uh, managing to see what's in there. If you guys see any sort of spammy stuff or anything like that, you know, here in the community, please let us know. Um, just go ahead and, you know, you know, Facebook us messages or something, me or, me or uh, William, and just say, hey, guys, there's some, you know, kooks putting out some pretty crazy stuff on there. Um, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, Nick will well, find them. Nick will find them for us. He'll pick them right, right out, man. Uh, I'll tell you what. <laughs> we've, creature. We've, got a, we've got a few people that will do that. I mean, when you guys saw, yeah. you know, Mark Dooley. Mark was one of the first people. He was the first person I put in there this morning. And uh, if, if you see the kind of comments Mark makes, you know, Mark's a pretty funny guy, but he's also our, our resident skeptic for the whole organization. And he nice. kind of routinely takes people like Jeff Meldrum and a few others to task oh, just because it's sort of his, it's sort of his job in life. So if, uh, <laughs> if, if Mark sees somebody up there making some stupid comment, Mark will tear him apart before we have the opportunity to save that person by removing him from the group. <laughs> <laughs> nice so we got to save it save these spammers from mark guys so that's what we're gonna do um so let us know so that mark doesn't you know i don't know pummel them on social media um, and he will. but all yeah all groups um if you guys are part of the g uh jrg um i'll tell you this right now um all you know the videos that you'd like to share content that you want to share um and just going in there and communicating once a day or every few days as often as you can get over there and share content there and also engage with us um you can throw up questions to william he'll check it out here and there during his day and answer some of those questions this is pretty much where uh, mr jevening is going to be spending most of his time when he's on facebook uh, so he will be pouring through a lot of stuff in there um, and uh, kind of peeling through it and, you know, seeing what's going on. Look at some of the conversations that many of us are having with each other as well from the different groups and everything around the country. Um, and just an update. Month what they're going for. And, and I'll tell you something about shows like that. one. If, if that one is hosted by Stacey Brown or Stars, and I, I think it is, um, if, if everyone knows anything about that, that. That was the um, uh, 
you remember the show a couple of years ago? It was only, I think it only ran one season, a reality show. It was something, uh, a $10 million big. Yes, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I saw that. Yeah. Now about the time of creating that show, <clears throat> uh, I think it was Spike TV that put that out. Uh, one yeah. of their casting people contacted me and, and just happened to call me as I was waiting outside uh, doing the show for the History Channel, uh, America's Book of Secrets, The Mystery of Bigfoot. I was waiting outside uh, the place where they were filming for my turn, and I got a call on my cell phone from the casting person for that show. And she was excited to talk to me, said that I was their number one overwhelming choice for this show. And uh, I was intrigued at the moment because I didn't know anything about it. So as, as I delved into finding out what the show was about, it, you know, it was, uh, it was a joke. Uh, they had a, a, a team of people who were supposed to be judging evidence, and they had ten, nine or ten teams that were all in one small geographical area. And I thought, well, how in God's name do they know, number one, where to look for Sasquatches, where they know exactly. evidence is going to be? And secondly, who are these people to judge whether evidence oh, is real or not? I had oh, never heard of any. We're of experts. <laughs> we know everything about so, the subject. You know, and and she says, "Well, you know, whoever brings in the best evidence is going to win ten million dollars, and the runner-up will get a hundred thousand. And Stacy Brown was, you know, I mean, I I wanted nothing to do with the show. I, I made up an excuse why I couldn't go on it. So. Uh, um, what happened was they they had this farcical show and. You know, they ran around collecting whatever was there, whether, I don't know. I didn't watch it. I can't watch stupid television. So um, he was the one that came out the presumptive winner. They gave him $100,000 and some equipment. Now he's and nothing nothing against the man personally. I don't know Stacy Brown. But, you know, you can't just because you're put on television and they give you some money doesn't mean that you're automatically an expert. It means they gave you some money for, you know, promotional purposes for television. So... Uh, back to this whole thing about, you know, Bigfoot being civilized. Uh, that's, that's a lot of presumptive uh, theorizing on virtually no information. That, that A statement like that means absolutely nothing. And we know the truth to be the exact opposite of that. You know, it, these things are very intelligent. But on the other hand, you know, they're not going to have a picnic next to you out on a Sunday outing some recordings and we're going to build those up for a while, put them into the system. So that way you guys have at least some sort of base of six to eight, like already done, you know, hour and a half little slots so that you guys have some, some good stuff to, uh, you know, stories and encounters to listen in on. Um, so this is going to be very coolly formatted. Uh, it's going to have all the fancy intro to it. It's going to be a lot like, Kind of what you're you've already heard from Mr. You know, uh, Jevning over the last you know couple of years at, at another place online is going to be very very similar to that kind of format, yeah. um, except for here it's going to be some straight up good old truth talking, speaking <laughs> stories and encounters from uh, real people. So it's going to be really awesome. <laughs> and I'm kind of thinking that a part of that we'll do a little, maybe a little discussion after the interview of the witnesses. Uh, and I mentioned Mark Dooley, our resident skeptic. Mark wants to come on with me. And uh, now Mark isn't just going to pick people apart. That's not what's going to happen. Uh, what he's going to do is provide kind of that fresh view from someone who isn't either pro or con on the topic, you know, to kind of help me uh you know, he wants to help look at situations, you know, with, with a more um, antiseptic view, I would say. You know, not 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 that we're just going to totally say, oh, yeah, we heard that noise. That was Bigfoot, obviously, you know, because Mark – I'm not that kind of person, and Mark's not that kind of person. So uh, and Mark Mark has, has a lot of humor, so we're going to have humor on it, so a little joking around and stuff. So uh, yeah. we're, we're and still kind of – Next week, real quick, William, um, guys, we'll, we'll be hosting the Blab on my Blab channel, so go ahead and follow right. me on Blab so you get the update. I will also put it on the website on the live stream page, so you'll see that. And uh, I'm going to have Gerald here. Hopefully, Gerald will be able to join us, and uh, maybe another person or two from the field would be great. I found your Blab spot, David, while I'm trying to get I've back actually, to you. I have. 
I have two of them. So you have to you have to follow the one that says D Booze Man here. The other one is for a network marketing gig I do and I talk MLM there all day. Um, this one right here, D Booze Man, is my internet marketing channel, but at the same time I use it for you know all kinds of cool stuff. So um, D Booze Man is the handle. So that's the one you follow. Awesome. Awesome. All right, fellas. Well, let's wrap it up for the evening. Thanks, for everyone, for joining us. And uh, join the fellows next week. I'll be off in San Diego enjoying myself. So uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Hey, music, the end of the show. Well, I'm right, everyone. <laughs> this is blab. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Night, everyone. All right, guys. One thing, Nick, there are, and I, and I think a lot of people don't realize this, there are a lot of wolves being reintroduced around the country and just coming back in naturally. And a wolf, of course, is much larger. Uh, I've got a, uh, a connection up in, in British Columbia who told me that uh, it's common for wolves to be 250 pounds. And he showed me, sent me pictures of wolves that they've shot. They're, they're enormous. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's very possible um, – you know, in this case, you know, if they're casting tracks of something that's dog-like, it, it is, these, this, has, this topic has nothing to do with Bigfoot and the four types, you know, and it's very likely if they're reporting dog legs and bushy tails, they're seeing a wolf and probably very large ones. And I would think, especially today, they're getting large because nobody's out killing them off and they have lots of food to eat. I tell you what, I can show you the track <laughs> on my dog, and you'd be freaked out. I'm not kidding you. Hey, but, uh, yeah. To get back to your interviewing, I think it's important Absolutely. to build a rapport with the person. You know, uh, let them get yeah. comfortable with you. Read them. If they're uncomfortable, you're not going to get much information out of anybody who's uncomfortable with you. But if you approach them in a manner, you know that that you care. You're really interested Absolutely. in the person. Find out about that person. You know, long before you start asking questions about the Bigfoot or whatever they've seen. You know, how long they've lived there in that area. You know, find out their background, what they did for work. You know, just get to know them so that, they, you know, then they can get comfortable with you because right. then they can see that you actually care about them. You know, you're not there to get a story or get, or get a quick interview so you can throw it on a piece of paper. Uh, because then you're, that person's going to get comfortable and then they're going to be willing to open and, up. And, and that's the thing, honest. you know, I, I've found interviewing people over the years, uh, you know, you got to chit chat with them and let them know. I let them know, hey, I'm, you know, I'm just, just like you. I'm just a regular guy out here looking around, but I, I'm doing this. And, um, I, and, and I always like using the example of the Goldhammer family in uh, Yakult, Washington, when back in 89, when their incident happened, uh, there had been several individuals and groups of so-called researchers that went to their farm ahead of me, even though I lived in the area. Some of these people raced down there from Seattle as soon as they got wind of the newspaper article. And uh, so when I went there, I, you know, I figured whatever, whatever evidence was there was probably gone or trampled on or, or something had happened to it. So I sort of went in, as I do with most incidents, with the approach that, well, let me let me talk to the people, and, I, and you ought to be got to be got to care about the people because first of all, they have to start uh, doing some recordings. We're going to build those up for a while, put them into the system, so that way you guys have at least some sort of base of six to eight like already done, you know, hour and a half little slots, so that you guys have some some good stuff to uh, you know stories and encounters to listen in on. Um, so. This is going to be very coolly formatted. Uh, it's going to have all the fancy intro to it. It's going to be a lot like kind of what you're, you've already heard from Mr. You know, uh, Jevening over the last you know couple of years at, at another place online. It's going to be very, very similar to that kind of format, yeah. um, except for here. It's going to be some straight-up good old truth-talking, speaking <laughs> stories and encounters from uh, real people. So it's going to be really awesome. And I'm kind of thinking that a part of that, we'll do a little, maybe a little discussion after the interview of the witnesses. Uh, and I mentioned Mark Dooley, our resident skeptic. Mark wants to come on with me. And uh, now Mark isn't just going to pick people apart. That's not what's going to happen. Uh, what he's going to do is provide kind of that fresh view 
from someone who isn't either pro or con on the topic, you know, to kind of help me, uh, you know, he wants to help look at situations, you know, with, with a more um, antiseptic view, I would say, you know, not, not, not that we're just going to totally say, Oh yeah, we heard that noise. That was Bigfoot, obviously, you know, because Mark, I'm not that kind of person and Mark's not that kind of person. So uh, and Mark, Mark has, has a lot of humor, so we're going to have humor on it. So a little joking around and stuff. So, uh, we're, and we're next kinda... week, <clears throat> next week, real quick, William, um, guys, we'll we'll be hosting the Blab on my Blab channel. So go ahead and follow right. me on Blab, so you get the update. I will also put it on the website on the live stream page, so you'll see that. And uh, I'm going to have Gerald here. Hopefully, Gerald will be able to join us, and uh, maybe another person or two from the field would be great. I found your Blab spot, David. Well. While- I actually to I have I have two <laughs> of them. So you have to you have to follow the one that says D Boozman here. The other one is for a network marketing gig I do and I talk MLM there all day. Um, this one right here at D Boozman is my internet marketing channel, but at the same time I use it for you know all kinds of cool stuff. So um, D Boozman is the handle. So that's the one you follow. Awesome. Awesome. All right, fellas. Well, let's wrap it up for the evening. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And uh, join the fellas next week. I'll be off in San Diego enjoying myself. So uh, we'll see you next week. All right. music the end of now, Will. Right, everyone. <laughs> this is blab. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Night, everyone. You know, so, yeah, go ahead, Thank Nick. You. They make these shows and act as if it's so safe for 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 ten year old kids to go out there and search. They say, "Oh, it's so safe. Go out there and search, kids. It's all, it's all." Yeah. Well, sure. They're they're trying to gather an audience. Yeah. It, and and here's yeah. The that's thing. like the one guy that I. I met real quick, William. I met a guy who served, and he was just like, yeah, dude, I had a great white shark, a young one that came, you know, kind of swimming by me, and I was like, hey, dude, what's up? And I'm like, no. <laughs> no. Well, that's like the guy from Alaska. It's a shark, you idiot. That's like the guy from Alaska, <laughs> like, remember, with the grizzly bears. You know, him and his girlfriend were up there, and they ended up they ended up being bear poop. I mean, you know, sorry to, yeah. you know, kind of class about it. that, but that's what happened. That's it. You that's know, you, you can't, and again, See, they, they, well, they got everybody the likes to. This is a, this is kind of a human psychological trait. We like to put, uh, you know, it's, this is it's an anthropomorphic behavior, which means placing human traits on non-human species, and it's what we do. All we do it with our cats and dogs all the time, you know. Well, the dog told me, you know, she didn't like her food or something. Really, the dog said that. <laughs> you know, I mean. <laughs> Uh, so it, it's just something so, we've got so in the habit of doing that uh, I think a lot of people do it without ever realizing, and, and they teach it right in preschool. You know, look how they teach kids. They use animals and things like that, and, they, and it, it's sort of ingrained at a very early age. And fortunately for us as a species, you know, we can get away with that because it doesn't depend on our survival to realize that things out there do not have our best interests at heart, you know, and, and could do grievous harm to us if we are in the wrong situation. So, and that's with just about any animal. There's, there's all kinds. I mean, heck, I had a weasel attack me one time. And uh, I don't know if it was rabbit or, or just a nasty little bugger, but it come charging out of, the, out of the tree line and my dog come racing in and, you know, that was it for the weasel. But uh, <clears throat> so animals, animals, depending on the circumstances, we'll do things that, you know, we don't think they're going to do because we've got the wrong concept in our minds about animal behaviors. And there's a, there's a good statement there. You might want to read from uh, Stuber zero three fat. Okay. Random thought. How many times you, how many times do you run into bears and no attack occurs, but no one would say they're benign just because the majority of the time people aren't attacked. We all know bears can be dangerous. Multiply the size, increased intelligence, and unknown mentalities of these things. The Sasquatch. I, yeah. You're not the only one. He said you're not the only one. And he started telling oh, yeah. me about situations at that campground. 
That's just I, down I can tell you place and the I hatchery. can tell you not far from I that hatchery. Camp. This was probably back. It was early '90s, '91, '92, somewhere in that time frame. I got a I got a report of a sighting up up that road, just up from the hatchery, less than a mile. And uh, and and this is kind of along the topic of odors. And I you know I've spent a lot of time in the field, and there's been very very seldom that I can honestly say that I smelled something that I w might have considered one of these creatures. Because, you know, I pretty few you're out in the outdoors, you get familiar with what's out there, what things smell like. Uh, on this occasion, it was raining very lightly. This was in the, I think it was in the fall. It could have been the spring. I, I don't remember the exact time frame, but it was, it was in a time when all the leaves were off the trees and, uh, and it was kind of chilly and wet. So uh, my buddy Jack and I decided to park before the area where the sighting was reported and we decided to walk, you know, in case, so we could see if there was any sort of evidence around without destroying it with the vehicle. Uh, as we walked along, we walked directly into a wall of stink. I can't even begin to describe. It made us both want to vomit. It was that powerful. And I just said, let's just keep going. And we covered our mouths and we walked out of it. And it wasn't, and it was in a very narrow area. It wasn't very big, maybe 30 feet. We walked into it, we gagged, and we walked out of it. And we walked on up the road about 100 yards or so. And I said, you know, if there was something, if there was something in there that was decaying, because it wasn't really decay, it was, I can't describe it. It was a combination of odors. It was animal smell. It was decay. It was, uh, you know, a mixture of I things. So, yeah, I was totally unfamiliar with it. So when we walked back to that spot moments later, the odor was completely gone. The air was clean. And I said, there you go. Something was right here, just out of our sight in the tree line, and it left. So I walked into the spot, and we found and it was just really heavy moss. You know how that area is, right? There's really thick moss on hard-packed ground. And you could see where the moss was pushed down by something very heavy. You now, you know how moss is in that area. It takes a lot of weight to push that down where you can see something was there. And, and the, ground was still, the ground was still warm where it was pressed down. Absolutely. And I couldn't make out any markings. It was, you know, it was a couple feet around. It was wow. big. But it, uh, whatever was there, stunk like hell. It was observing us. And as soon as we walked on, it departed. And when we came back, it was gone. So... I don't know where we were going with that. Oh, it was the same area that you were just talking about with this uh, guy, Ray. <laughs> um, this will be a members only kind of a deal, um, but it will be coming out around the end of February, beginning of March at some point. He's actually going to start as soon as he gets back from his vacation. Well, he's going to have start uh, doing some recordings. We're going to build those up for a while, put them into the system. So that way you guys have at least some sort of base of six to eight, like already done, you know, hour and a half little slots. So that you guys have some some good stuff to uh, you know stories and encounters to listen in on. Um, so this is going to be very coolly formatted. Uh, it's going to have all the fancy intro to it. It's going to be a lot like kind of what you're you've already heard from Mister you know uh, Jevning over the last you know couple years at, at another place online. It's going to be very very similar to that kind of format. Yeah. Um, except for here, it's going to be some straight up good old truth talking, speaking <laughs> stories and encounters from uh, real people. So it's going to be really awesome. And I'm kind of thinking that a part of that, we'll do a little, maybe a little discussion after the interview of the witnesses. Uh, and I mentioned Mark Dooley, our resident skeptic. Mark wants to come on with me. And uh, now Mark isn't just going to pick people apart. That's not what's going to happen. Uh, what he's going to do is provide kind of that fresh view from someone who isn't either pro or con on the topic, you know, to kind of help me, uh, you know, he wants to help look at situations, you know, with, with a more um, antiseptic view, I would say, you know, not, not, not that we're just going to totally say, Oh yeah, we heard that noise. That was Bigfoot, obviously, you know, because Mark, I'm not that kind of person and Mark's not that kind of person. So, uh, and Mark, Mark has, has a lot of humor, so we're going to have humor on it. So a little joking around and stuff. So, uh, yeah. we're, and we're next still kind of. <clears throat> next week, real quick, William, um, guys, we'll, we'll be hosting the blab on my blab channel. So go ahead and follow right. me on blab. So you get the update. I will also put it on the website on the live stream page. So you'll see that 
and uh, I'm going to have Gerald here. Hopefully, Gerald will be able to join us, and uh, yeah, maybe found, another person or two from the field uh, would be great. I found your blab spot, David. While I'm trying to get I've back, actually, to I have. I have two of them, so you have to you have to follow the one that says D Boozman here. The other one is for a network marketing gig I do, and I talk MLM there all day. Um, this one right here, D Boozman, is my internet marketing channel, but at the same time, I use it for you know all kinds of cool stuff. So um, D Boozman is the handle, so that's the one you follow. Awesome. Awesome. All right, fellas. Well, let's wrap it up for the evening. Thanks for everyone for joining us and. Uh, Join the fellows next week. I'll be off in San Diego enjoying myself. So uh, we'll see you next week. All right. Music, the Amber Spot. And we found it was just really heavy moss. You know how that area is, Ryan. There's really thick moss on hard packed ground. And you could see where the moss was pushed down by something very heavy. You now, you know how moss is in that area. It takes a lot of weight to push that down where you can see something was there. And, and the ground was still. The ground was still warm where it was pressed down. Absolutely. And I couldn't make out any markings. It was, you know, it was a couple feet around. It was wow. big. But it, uh, whatever was there, stunk like hell. It was observing us. And as soon as we walked on, it departed. And when we came back, it was gone. So I don't know where we were going with that. Oh, it was the same area that you were just talking about with this uh, guy, Ray. <clears throat> but that area's had a long area, of, a long time of activity in there. Oh yeah, it, it really has. I've heard. I've had a couple of people. I know a few people that are very oh, that, that have seen it. that area. That area has always been very active up there. Absolutely, and that's such a, a tremendous wilderness area. Oh, it is. You know, yeah, it's, it's just beautiful. Just beautiful. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, you better have some legs underneath your body. That's Jerry, that's, that's, some steep, <laughs> that's steep country. That's, that's steep country. That's steep country in there. Nice. I told, I went up there. Uh, when back was when I was in my early thirties, I, I tromped all over that country. But uh, <laughs> you know, at this at this age, that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> There's either going to be a horse or some kind of vehicle under me getting uh, me around those places. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm getting too old to be nice. doing all that stuff. I mean, not, not that I won't go out there. Yeah, not that I won't go out there, but That's I'm not going to hike my old butt around some of that woods anymore. I'm not going to set myself up to be a happy meal. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm telling you, it is nasty. I'm talking oh, like yeah. 65 oh, to 85 percent. Yeah, I don't. Rate, I don't have you know, any desire to be tagged ass. and bagged. <laughs> <laughs> hey, anybody who's familiar with nice. uh, mountaineering I'm... terms, uh, so a friend of mine who was uh, a mountain climber told me once that that's what they that's what they call it. If somebody's climbing and they can't make it any further, they'll put them in their sleeping bag and they'll they'll kind of anchor them to a spot and they tag them in case the person passes out or whatever. And then they collect them up on the way back. So if you're bagged and tagged, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> I I have no intention nice. of becoming, you know, a wrapped you know, I don't I don't want to be a, 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 a burrito or anything, a Bigfoot burrito out there. So 